if you had a mother, then happy Mother's Day to you too, right? I think that covers everyone. We all celebrate moms today, and it is great to be in God's house. I want to share a story about a mom that uh, changed one man's life drastically. About 25 years ago, I had the chance to eat lunch with a guy named Rick Stanley. And after he had shared his testimony to a packed house of high school teenagers, and the altar call was given, and I mean, the response was phenomenal, I had a chance to sit down and, and, and eat with him. And he was sharing me some amazing things about his testimony and how in the, in the history of one moment, because of one decision his mom had made, his entire life changed. The trajectory of his entire life changed. One minute, he is a typical young boy living in middle America, eight or nine years old. And the next minute, because of a decision his mom made, his entire life changed. See, what happened was Rick and his brothers, his two brothers and his mom, loaded up the car and they drove. And they drove and they drove because there was a surprise happening. A marriage was about to take place. And as they pulled into the driveway of their new house, here's a picture of it here. Here's a picture of it here. Yep. Boom, there it is. His life changed. Anybody recognize that place? It is Graceland. Yes. Rick's mom, Dee Stanley, married Vernon Presley, Elvis's father. So within the course of a second, this became his new family. And he said as he walked up, this is Rick right here, and this is his mom. You recognize that guy in the middle? The king, thank you very much. Here he is. Rick said his first impression, he walked into the lobby of Graceland, and he looked around. He was just in awe, and he saw this larger-than-life presence standing by the fireplace looking at photos. And when that man, whom we know who he is, heard the door open, he said his head snapped in the coolest way. His hair was just whoa. And he said he just, he just kind of glided over to Rick. He didn't walk. He was, just, he was so cool. He just kind of slid over. And he knelt down. He said, Rick, it is so good to have you. I have always wanted a little brother. And now I have three. Welcome to your new home. I am your big brother. And in a moment, his world changed. And he had everything this world could offer. He grew up. He began to be the uh, trainer and the bodyguard to Elvis. He also ended up becoming this uh, personal assistant here. And his life was going awesome. He had everything the world could offer. I mean everything. They would close down toy stores, Elvis would, so his little brothers could go and buy anything they want. There was no limit. Just go get it. They would shut down the store, and they could come out with their arms full of whatever they wanted. I could tell you a story after. I don't have time for it. I'll tell you, maybe on Father's Day, I'll share the other side of this. But all of this came crashing down one day, and Rick had an epiphany, and it changed his life again because he was so empty. There were things that were not fulfilling to his life. Even though, according to the world, he had everything, fame, fortune, popularity, girlfriends, you name it, at his fingertips, but he's still empty. So we're sitting there eating, and I said, what, what changed? And he said, Matt, there came a time where I had to start taking my faith seriously, because he'd met a love interest in his life who was sold out to Jesus. And his current life and the life he knew he should be living were just like this. To make a long story short, he looked at me and he said, Matt, and I remember this. I remember this 25 years later. He said, Matt, there comes a time in everyone's life where the little boy has got to sit down and the man has to stand up. And we got to start living a bold faith for the Lord. I was like, wow, that's all. Can I quote you on that? 25 years later, I'm still sharing that because as I read Daniel chapter 3, that is exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They stood against the culture. Go ahead and turn with me there, but don't read it yet. I want to set the context. While you pull up Daniel 3, let me welcome those who are streaming with us. It is good to have you with us. I think my mom is watching. Hi, Mom. How are you doing? There you go. You can wave to her. Good. This is an incredible passage that we're going to read. The culture was just like today. I mean, it is, it is like it's ripped from the headlines today. King Nebuchadnezzar, if you're not sure what's happened up to this point, had been on the war path. He had been conquering countries and peoples, and, and what he did is when he captured a city, he would go to and he would pick the, the best and the brightest of everyone in that culture, the brightest engineers, the mathematicians, the arts, the singer, everything, everything that had good culture. He would take them captive and bring them back to Babylon, bringing the best and the brightest of every conquered populace back to Babylon. Why? Because he wanted Babylon to be in a league by itself, and it was. 
You want to talk about an empire, a dynasty in the making. King Nebuchadnezzar had it going on because he would steal these great minds and have a brain drain over there, but everything would stand here in Babylon. It was awesome. What he would do is he would immerse them, the captured people, in his culture, in the Babylonian culture. He would give them lavish things. He would appoint people to high-ranking positions, and he would even change their names. If he had a Jewish name, he would change it. That's what he did to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said, no more are you going to be known as, as Hananiah. Now you're Shadrach. No more are you going to be known as Mishael. You will be Meshach. And Azariah, hmm, I'm going to name you after a pagan Babylonian god, Nebo. I'm going to call you Abednego. And he changed their names. And so Daniel gets appointed to this really high position. He's ruler over the entire province of Babylon, as well as all of the chief wise men that the king had. These chief wise men, by the way, were, they had it made until Daniel showed up. So right away, they don't like the new guy. Remember that, okay? They can't stand that they have to submit to this Jew. He came, why is he so important? So Daniel goes to the king and convinces him, hey, I got my three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and I want you to appoint them to high places too. So they get, at, the, at Daniel's request, appointed. And it is, everything's going great, so it seems. But apparently the king needs an ego stroking or something. I don't know if he's not getting attention. I don't know what it is. He had a bad day, but he commands a 90-foot tall statue of gold to be built, possibly in his image. I don't know, but it's a 90-foot tall statue. And then he says, we're going to have this big celebration, this huge party, and I want you all to come out. In fact, I'm going to send out invitations for everyone to come. And I'm talking governors and prefects and magistrates and judges, advisors, and, and, and anyone who's anyone needs to be at this party. It is going to be the mother of all celebrations, okay? It's kind of one of those, by the way, if you get invited to the king's party, you go. It's not really an option. It's like, he shows up, it's like, I want to thank you all for attending this mandatory celebration, right? See what I'm saying? It's, it, believe me, everybody was there. One count says there was 300,000 people showing up for this soiree for this great shindig. So King Nebuchadnezzar comes out, he signals for quiet, and he has one of his chief heralds shout out, people, when you hear the music, you must bow down and you must worship this giant golden statue. And if you don't, you will immediately be thrown into the fiery furnace. So evidently, there's a fiery furnace nearby this giant statue. Maybe it was the one they used to build it. We, we don't know, but there was something horrible nearby. And they saw this fiery furnace and they knew Mm, that's bad. We don't want to go there. Let's just make a note that we're not going to do that. So verse 7 comes, and it's all the throngs, all the people show up to the dedication. They hear the music, and they begin to fall to the ground. Let me show you what it was not. They weren't sitting here, had their Diet Coke, and they weren't having this party like, oh, isn't it great to be here? And Oh, so how was your day? And oh, that's good. Have you seen anybody get eaten by lions lately? Is there anything? Wait, do you hear music? Oh, this might be the time we're supposed to... Here, will you hold this drink? Let, we should probably take a knee. It wasn't like that at all. The original Hebrew literally says, the minute they heard the sound of the music, they collapsed. They were falling. They were diving on their face. Why? Because every one of them had heard about King Nebuchadnezzar, and they knew he was ruthless. And they knew, you don't want to be the last man standing. You, can you imagine? 300,000 people, boom, prostrate on the floor. They hear the music, and you being like the last guy, like, oh, hang on a sec. Can you imagine how you would stand out? Can you imagine the fear if you get interpreted, even wrongly, that, oh, you didn't bow close fast enough? Why don't you grab him, and let's make an example. No one wanted. That's why the Hebrew is very specific. As soon as they were hearing, it was a race to see who could hit the ground first, except for three people who went against everyone. They didn't even bow their heads, let alone their bodies. These three showed such incredible courage. Now, there were so many people jealous of Daniel and his three amigos, all these Chaldeans, all these advisors, they couldn't wait to go report this to the king. So they come running up to the king, and they are just, man, you can just see their eagerness. They're chomping at the bit. They're like, oh, king, oh, king, you, you're not going to believe what happened. You are not going to believe that. And that's where we pick up the story. Read with me right there, starting in Daniel 3, verse 8. So at this time, the astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. All right, pause there. Denounced. By the way, the original Hebrew here, the word denounced, doesn't mean like, mm, they're bad. It literally means they tore them to shreds with their words. 
They cut them in pieces. They, they, you want to talk about gossip. They slandered these guys. That's what the word denounce means. It was, it was like over the top bad news. Verse 9, they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, may the king live forever. All right, pause. I love this. If you're going to go gossip about somebody, always begin with a compliment, right? Oh, may the king live forever. I have bad news for you. Hey, you want, remember do those three? Okay, all right. And they go on. Look what they say. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of God. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. Right? They're reminding the king of this, right? As if he needs to be reminded. Verse 12, I love this. But there are some Jews here whom you have said, oh, look, look who they point to. They're like holding up a mirror to the king, like, don't forget, this was your decision, okay? There's some Jews here that you put up over all these affairs of the province of Babylon. You know who they are. Let me remind you, king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they pay no attention to you, your majesty. They don't serve your gods. They don't worship the image of gold. You have said it. See how they're stoking the flames? They're building this up. Do you think it had the desired effect? Look at the next word. Furious with rage. Your Bible, I promise, does not say mildly annoyed. The king did this. It says furious with rage. Nebuchadnezzar immediately, boom, summons him. Get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in here. So the men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar says to them, is it true? Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't serve my gods? That you don't worship this gold idol that I've set up? All right, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Here, 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 I'm going to be magnanimous. He says, now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down now and worship the image I've made, oh, very good. All is well, right? Well, just, just to show I'm so reasonable, I'm so open-minded and tolerant. Oh, yeah, but if you don't worship it, you'll be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? This is beautiful. I want to pause and look at this because that's a rhetorical question if I've ever seen one. He is not asking for information. You know what I'm saying? I don't think the king is saying, I, I, I'd like to know some information. What, what God is it that's going to deliver you? And they're like, um, you want to know? It's, it's Yahweh. Do you, do you, can you tell me? He is not at, We do this as parents all the time. We ask rhetorical questions where we don't want an answer. And if our kids give us one, <clears throat> they're in trouble. For instance, have you ever asked them, do you want to go in timeout? Do you want a spanking? You're not asking them for their opinion. You're not asking them for information. They're, they're, we, we do this all the time. This is no kid who's asked that question ever says, well, I was going to go play some Xbox, but now that you mention it, a spanking, that sounds pretty sweet. I think I'm going to sign me up for that. No, you're making a statement. You are not asking a question. Like, do you really want to spank it? It's, it's, the king is not doing this for information. He is making an absolute statement saying, guys, your, your lives are in my hands. I own you. You obey me or else. Hear those fires? Yeah. That's what awaits you if you don't do what I say. And what God is going to deliver you from my flames? Because he knew there wasn't one, or so he thought. And I love their reaction. They don't treat it as a rhetorical question like you and I would. They have the audacity to answer him. They say, look, if you had to shock the king, look with me, verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, <clears throat> we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know something, uh, your majesty. They're always polite. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. What bold confidence. Y'all, would we do this? They're in the presence of the king, the man who holds their lives in their hands. Think about this. The whole crowd bowed down. Everybody bowed low, except these three young Jews. And upon hearing this news and getting infuriated by these gossipers who came and tattled, on these, these three or four guys standing up, the king calls them in and says, is it true? Is it true? That question could be asked of every Christian in America today. This is, this is from the headlines of America. Think how similar the culture is from Babylon to where we are in 2017. Today, we're everyone, we're all encouraged to get along. They say, don't rock the boat, man, what are you doing? Can, can, you, can you just 
just quit taking your faith so seriously. You, you Christians, you're just so unique and weird. I, don't you simple Christians know that we live in the age of tolerance? Don't you know this is the age of inclusiveness? You just need to kind of go along with the crowd. And right now, we're all bowing down. Why aren't you? Quit rocking the boat. That question is so perfect. Tolerance, that's the buzzword then. It's the buzzword today. I'm reading this new book, just came out by O.S. Hawkins called The Daniel Code. Wow, oh wowzers, wow. This is so amazing. I've only gotten just a few pages into it, but right away, I see what inspired O.S. Hawkins. He was taken under his wing by this godly older gentleman who was the CEO of a huge company in Dallas. After that, he was so loved by his people, they elected a mayor of the city. His name was uh, Jack Evans, and O.S. Hawkins says when he walked in to meet him, there was a plaque on the wall, and he never forgot. It's a short phrase, and it just stuck with him. And the phrase was this, you have what you tolerate. You have what you tolerate. Now think about this. We have today what we tolerated yesterday. If we tolerated out-of-control spending on our credit cards yesterday, we have today massive debt, right? If we tolerated eating five dozen Krispy Kreme donuts every night before going to bed for six months, you have today a triple chin, right? Are you with me? You are not going to be uh, swimsuit ready, shall we say. If we give ourselves over to horrible eating habits, we will probably not be ready when it comes time for spring break. In fact, I have a self-portrait here. When you think you look cute, but you just are not spring break ready. Too many Krispy Kremes, and we've all been there. We've all been there. That's, you're not going to have the beach body you're hoping for if you don't reap what good things you've sown the day before. Do you see what, see what this is going? We have today what we tolerated yesterday. Parents can attest to this. Again, if you've ever been to Walmart, oh, God bless America for Walmart. When you're standing in that checkout line and you are behind that kid who is being so disrespectful to those poor parents, there's probably something going on there. A disrespectful child who knows no boundaries will grow up to be that disrespectful adult who is entitled, who thinks everything's about them, who cannot handle the word no, and thinks the world revolves around them. And it goes on, and they have no respect for authority, and no respect for their spouse, and no respect for their parents, and, and it goes on and on, because the process continues. We'll have tomorrow what we tolerate today. If we tolerate sin in our own life, we will reap the consequences of that tomorrow. See, tolerance, this used to mean something totally different. Tolerance used to be such a great word in my vocabulary because it used to mean that we respected other people, even if we didn't agree, even if we didn't agree with their beliefs or their values, even if we didn't share them or their politics, we still treated other with respect and tolerance. But today, that message has totally changed. It has been redefined to mean something totally different. Now it means everyone's values, everyone's faith claims, everyone's claims to truth, everyone's lifestyles must be equally celebrated and unquestionably accepted, even if it goes against God's word. Oh, well, I draw a line there. We don't get to redefine God's word. We're the messengers. We're the bearers of it. We're not the editors. Don't get to go, <laughs> that doesn't mean, <laughs> he didn't really mean that. Jesus was kind of a a, a mythical figure. We just like, like unicorns. They're just great. We just love them, but no one's really seen one. You see what I'm saying? Tolerance has been redefined, and y'all, I saw it just this week. Again, my favorite bumper sticker. I was driving down the road, and pow, there it was. And I used to like this. I might have even put this on my car, and if you did, you're not a bad person because I don't know anyone who doesn't want to coexist and live peaceably with others. Every one of you is fine with that and wants to. The problem comes when we embrace every road as we say, all roads lead to God, right? That's not what the Bible says. And we're not hearing that anymore. The pulpits, even across the country, are largely silent. Jesus showed up and he says, uh, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the In fact, you want to know what the better bumper sticker is? It's this one right here based on that. 
contradict. <laughs> they can't all be true. If this guy over here says he's the way, and this guy over here, and then we come and we go, no, 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 no. He's exclusive. He's for everyone, but he is the way. He is the truth in life. They can't all be true. Not every road leads to Holly Springs. If I get on one that's leading to Durham, I'm going to end up in Durham. Do you see the difference? So we got this huge mishmash, hodgepodge, limp wristed half-baked kind of theology going around. Where just, just, just get along. Just be okay. It's, it's, you know, no. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying to us, guys, if they could scream one thing, one word of encouragement to us, it's three simple words to the church today. Don't give in. Don't give in. Don't compromise. Stay strong. Stay bold. Don't give in to the crumbling culture around you. Your faith will be tested. Woven all through Daniel chapter 3 is the theme of peer pressure. Everybody's bowing. Everybody's bowing. I mean, like, nobody is like, hey, you're going to bow? I don't think I'm going to bow. You're not going to bow either, are you? We'll just stand here and sip our Diet Cokes. Oh, no, 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 no. Man, they're throwing their stuff down, and there's a race to see who can hit the deck. Let's be honest. Can we be honest? It's a potter's hand. You can take your mask off. It's okay to be safe here. It is a lot easier to go with the crowd. Is it not? It is so much easier. Just, just everybody's going this way. But we'll just go over the cliff together. Moo, moo, right? We'd all just, like a herd of cows off the cliff. It is so much easier to go along and get along. I get it. And God's word gets it. But maybe it's not okay. Maybe that's not what God's calling you. Maybe he says, I'm calling you to be separate, to be a holy and a chosen generation, a peculiar people that stand out as lights in the darkness. You know, we love to tell ourselves it's okay. I'm, Pastor, I may be bowing on my knees with my body, but my heart is still standing up praising the Lord. Right. Right, that defiant kid. I'm, I'll go to my room, but my heart, I'm still standing right here like this, Mom. I just, it's, it's okay. I remember the first time my son heard a loud noise. He did the weirdest thing. He pulled his pass out. He goes, oh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay, Milo. It's okay. And I looked at him like, and I looked at Amy. I said, what's wrong with your son? <laughs> right? Whenever he does something wrong, it's her son. You know? If he's leading someone to Jesus, that's my boy. Right? But... You know, he's like, it's so, what, what is this? She's like, he's comforting himself. He's, he's self-soothing. He's trying to tell himself. He's scared. And he's used to when he hears a loud noise, we're there and we hold him. And what do we do? We pat him and we say, it's okay. It's okay, Milo. He's doing it to himself. He's soothing himself. It's okay. What if it's not okay? What if Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are screaming to us, church, stay strong, Wrong is wrong, no matter if everyone's doing it. And right is right, even if no one is doing it. Ooh, that's, well, that's not politically correct. That's not popular. Man, you take this Jesus thing seriously. Yes, because he's the only one I know of who was perfect and died for me. He did it all. And he's worthy of our worship. Look at Daniel's three friends. Everyone's bowing down. In fact, we have an actual picture of one of them bowing down right here. See that? Everyone's doing, oh, it's so cute. Well, yeah, well, they were pagans, so there you go. And they're bowing down, and Ryan caught an actual photo of Daniel and his three amigos standing tall, standing firm. There it is, right there. They're standing strong. They are standing against the grave. You don't think that was obvious on the plane? You don't think they're looking across this huge des desert plain and they go, are you seeing these people stand up? Go tell the king. And they didn't care. Consequences. They came. They stood before the king and they said, King, we're not going to do this. Shadrach, Meshach, they're, they're telling us through the centuries, guys, don't compromise. Even if you think it's just one time, or just one compromising of your values, one compromising of your faith. They're saying, no, don't do it. It's not worth it. In a world of tolerance, our faith will be tested just like theirs was. Count on it. And we'll have tomorrow what we plant today. We will reap what we sow. Everything we do not stand for, we will face it tomorrow in full measure. We see it happening. There is a dynamic and a synergy when we stand together like those three and four guys did. When we link arms, we say, we're going to get each other's back. 
We're going to be that peculiar people who actually loves people, who's not afraid of saying, hey, I'm one beggar where I found food. You want to come and find food at this great table? It's free, but it costs this one man everything. And we're not afraid to do that. We don't judge the people. God's Word does that. All we do is hold up the truth, and God will take care of the rest. That's what they're telling us to do, guys. Don't give in. Don't let the culture dictate the values. You dictate the values. If there's one other thing I think they could tell us today, it's don't give up. Don't give up. Some of you are so tired. Some of you are so beaten up and worn down, and life has just spit you out. They have hope for you. It, it's, it's amazing to me how Babylon was so pluralistic, how enlightened and, and open-minded they were and how secular they were becoming, just like our society today. So many people today are quick to incorrectly label Bible-believing Christians as the most intolerant people on the planet. They don't know the people I know. Because no one wants to be intolerant of anyone. All it is is being obedient to the Father. A heart full of love. Think about this. The, the reality of it, let's just call it what it is. You haven't changed. God's word hasn't changed. God hasn't changed his mind. The culture has changed. The sands have shifted around our bedrock. We're not the ones who've shifted. You didn't wake up one day and go, I think I'm going to change everything I believe. No, 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 no. No, make no mistake. The culture has changed. In fact, the people now are intolerant of anyone who honors this book. Where is the tolerance of your faith? That's why we have to be so full of love and compassion while being bold at the exact same time. That's what these people were giving us the example. Now, let me give you guys just a little bit of good news through this. Jesus said this was coming. He said, prepare for it. Take heart. It's okay. John 14, 30, Jesus is saying to us, he's telling us that Satan is the one who dominates the evil world system for now. This evil world system is in direct rebellion to God's standard. Okay? So we know that. Therefore, the world not only hates Jesus, but it will hate those who follow him. Look with me in John chapter 15 here. Jesus says this, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, but you don't. As it is, you don't belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And if they persecuted me, this is Jesus, uh, they're going to persecute you. Count on it. It's a good thing. It means you're standing up. It means, are you ready for this? It means you look like Jesus. Isn't that what we want? When people see you walk in a room, like, oh, you remind me of somebody, the Lord. <laughs> wow, what a compliment. Oh, that we are known for a people who look and resemble and have been with Jesus. And that's what they're coming up. The word hate here, by the way, is the Greek word meseo. You know what it means? It literally means detest. I despise you. That's what Jesus is saying in the original Koine Greek. He says, those that detest Jesus will detest you. They will hate you. Count on it. It is a badge of honor. You are in good company. Take heart. Be bold. I would rather be hated for speaking God's truth than hailed and applauded for trying to redefine it any day of the week. Are you there? Are you with that? Do you get that? Is your faith that kind of bold? See, upon hearing this news that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are standing firm on their faith, the king summons them into his presence, and he wants to know this one question. He says, is this true? Tell me what's going on. Check out their response. It is so bold. It is so awesome. It gives me such strength. These men, they didn't give in to peer pressure earlier when everybody's bowing down, and they're not about to give in to fear pressure right now in front of the king. Their response is classic. Read it with me. They say, uh, the God we serve, sir, is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, let it be known to you, O king, <laughs> oh, we will not be serving your gods. They're saying this to the king. Would you? Would I? We're not going to serve your God. He's even given him a second chance. I'll tell you what, just bow down now. We'll play the little hoop, little, little do, 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 and you can bow down. We'll just, we'll just, we'll just pretend this, this little ugly soiree didn't happen. And they say, not only no, but no twice. Our God can deliver us. How is this possible? What bold faith is this? You know why? I found the answer. 
How are they able to stand up and be bold? Because their faith wasn't based on God's performance. It wasn't based on God performing and I'm going to do a magic trick and whoop, deliver you from these flames and pull you out. Their faith was based on God's person, on who he is, on who he is. Even if he never did another thing, their faith was secure. It wasn't about God showing up and doing some great magic trick and blowing the flames out or anything. He's totally able to do that, and they knew it. But notice, not one time did they ever ask God, Lord, would you please put these flames out? They spoke of his ability to deliver them, but they never called on God to kill the king, blow the flames out. I would have. <laughs> I get near those flames like, ooh, Lord, it's time. It's getting awful hot. How about... Uh, I don't want to be some stakeums here. This, this is going to be bad news. You, you, got, you got about 13 seconds for them close enough. Think about this. This is so, what a powerful testimony. There's a scene in one of my all-time favorite movies, Facing the Giants, where the man is out in the field, and he is weeping. He is a failure by all accounts. And he's standing there with his Bible, and he's pouring his heart out with the Lord. He thinks he's by himself. He says, God, I am a failure. I can't provide for my wife. I had to push the car into the driveway just to get it out of the road. I can't fix everything that's broken in the house. I can barely pay the mortgage. I'm about to lose my job. I can't even coach the stinking football team to a winning season. I feel like giants of fear and doubt are staring down at me right now, and I am a total failure. And now I just found out the worst news of all, God. We will never be able to have children, something my wife wants more than anything. And to make it all worse, Lord, to show that I'm the failure, we found out it's not her, it's me. I'm the reason we can't have kids. And in that moment, the wife walks up and stands next to him, tears streaming down her face. And he looks, it's a beautiful tear-jerking moment. And he says, if God never did another thing for us, if God never gives us children, will you still love him? Will you still praise him? She had one word answer. Tears streaming down her face. She looked up and she just said, yes. Why? Because their faith wasn't built on what God does, his performance. God, if you do this, if you answer my prayer, if you tap dance when I call you, I'm going to rub the magic genie lamp and I expect you to grant me my wishes. That's a faith that's based on performance. And that's not a God. That's a genie. God doesn't answer to us. Their faith was based on his personhood. God, if you never do another thing for me, you have done more than enough. I worship you. I give you my heart. I surrender the one thing you won't take by force, myself. What a beautiful, powerful example. So here's my challenge this week for us. When the fires come, and they will, when you're standing near the furnace and you're feeling the heat, and you will, I want you to ask yourself this question. Is my faith based on God's performance or is it based on his person, who he is? Why do you really worship God? What a challenge. You see, that honest answer will tell you all you need to know about your faith. That will reveal so much about where you are on your spiritual maturity journey. Only you can answer. That's your challenge. That's bold. Wait till next week. It gets even bolder. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to commit our hearts to the Lord, okay? Let's pray together. God, I thank you for the power of your word. Sometimes those days when you can hear a pin drop, Lord, is when your spirit is working the most, and I thank you for that. Thank you for what you do in my life as I prepare this long before anyone sees it or hears it. You have dealt with me, and I thank you, Lord, that you didn't leave us as orphans to go wander our own way but you are our heavenly Father. Lord, we pray that we would surrender our hearts and our minds and our lives, every corner of every room of our life, that we would be bold as lions and innocent as doves. God, I pray when people see us this week, they would know we are a people who have been with you. We submit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.